The Zoom UAC 232 retails for $199.99 US dollars. Inside the box, you get the unit, you get two flat cable fasteners, you get the documentation, of course, and a USB C cable. Zoom claims that the UAC 232 is the first dedicated 32 bit float audio interface. While there's been other devices that you can use as an interface, this one is a dedicated interface. So the idea with 32-bit float is that you can record clip-free recordings without the need to set gain levels. The device is capable of music mode and streaming mode. Music mode allows you to route your inputs into your DAW, while streaming mode combines those inputs into a single signal for streaming. After you've downloaded their driver and software, the 32-bit float icon will light up. And this works for PC and Mac, but if you're streaming on iOS, you are downgraded to 24-bit. And you need separate powering because it's a bus-powered unit, but it also has a, another port for 5-volt power. So keep that in mind if you're going to be using it on iOS. Build-wise, I found it to be really lightweight, about 12 and a half ounces. Mostly plastic build, but depending on how you orient it, the sides or top and bottom if you're standing up are a metal alloy. The preamps are supposed to be the same preamps they use in the F6 and they have a rating of negative 127 dBU or less. The sample rate can go all the way up to 192 kilohertz. You have a 100 milliwatt headphone output. I'll get to the headphones a little later on. You have MIDI in and out and high Z capability in input number one. The plastic buttons are sturdy and make an audible click when you press them down. The output knob and the tiny headphone knob are sturdy and have very little to no give. The device requires just five volts to be powered, which comes in really good handy. And then you, of course you have two quarter inch outputs. Software wise, you have to download and install Zoom's proprietary driver in order to get 32 bit float to work on your PC or Mac. Installation was a breeze, along with their lightweight Zoom Mix Control software. It's very easy to set up. Compatibility wise, there's a wide array of software that it works with, including DaVinci Resolve and the free Audacity and many others. In my non-scientific testing, I found that the noise floor on the UAC 232 to be a little louder than my Rodecaster Pro 2. Like I said, not a scientific test, but roughly 4 dB louder. The software is very simplistic. You have the ability on channel one and channel two to move gain up and down. You can set it to streaming or music mode, which I talked about earlier. And then you can pan or set levels on each of those two channels. And then if you click the loop back, I had it work instantaneously. I've seen reports on the web of people struggling to get it to work, but I had no issues whatsoever getting loop back to work effectively. It was just a click of the button, and then when I clicked it back off, it stopped. But now I want to start going down my list of pros and then cons. To me, the device has excellent sound quality. Outside of the slightly increased noise floor in my personal situation, I found the sound to be very clean and crisp. I like that you can just use this bus powered on a PC or Mac. And then if you do need an external battery, you're only going to have to push 5 volts. Another pro, I thought it was a great idea that they included the loop back in the software. I hope more audio interfaces will include that in some lightweight software with it. Because when you have to do it outside of the device itself, using software on your computer, it can be a little tedious to set up. I hope more companies will incorporate that with their standalone audio interfaces. I'm an old guy. I used to have an Xbox 360, so I appreciate that you can orient the device laying down or standing up, but we'll come back to that. I do appreciate the sturdiness of the buttons and the fact that they're illuminated with this cool blue color. I also appreciate the sturdiness of the knobs. Since I'm not talented, I had to take the device over to my brother-in-law, who is very talented, and he helped me test the monitor out, 
and the high Z input by playing guitar, which I'll show you a little bit in just a minute. Another pro, obviously, is you can see the musical leaning with the MIDI in and out. And lastly, the handles provided offer you different mounting options. Now, for a few seconds, I'll let the talent of the family take it away. <laughs> I wish I had talent. On the cons, the fact that you don't get a gain knob on the device, but you get it in the software is frustrating to me for one particular reason, and that is it diminishes the true portability of the device. I don't have an iOS phone. I am on Android. And what if I just want to rock out in somebody's basement and capture all the stuff I could use a power bank to power it. I could have a portable recorder to record what we're doing. But unfortunately, I wouldn't be able to manipulate the gain unless I have access to that software. So to me, it's more of a gimmick than it is an actual feature. Also, around $200, I start to expect an on-off switch. And like I mentioned, Android support, while not necessarily expected, would have been nice to have. I think companies could start making their own lightweight app in the Google Play Store that would allow you to use your particular Android device with their interface. I understand there's so many builds of Android that that gets confusing fast, but it would be nice to see somebody make an attempt. Another con I have is the unit's weight being so light. When I have my XLR or other cables plugged into it, if there's any tension on them, they just go twisting the device around and that gets a little frustrating and to stick with it moving around on the desk the little handles on it have wheels on it like these little rollers on it and that just helps it just roll right around it rolled almost off my desk entirely when i first got it that's just a little curious to me why it's design like that. Also at around that $200 mark, I start to expect the device to have a mute button on the channels. And even if we put that aside, there's not a mute button in the software either, which I find kind of perplexing. Now I personally had issues with the headphone out, especially when I was using the Shure SM7B, I would hit direct monitor and I'd crank it up a bit so I could hear myself back because I always like to monitor my own voice when I'm recording. When I don't do that, trouble can happen. Zoom commented on one of my videos and they said, hello, thank you for posting a video about the UAC-232. If the direct monitoring function is activated, but there is no input signal, then an artificial noise will be sent to the headphone output. This is normal for all audio interfaces. If you deactivate direct monitoring, this will be eliminated. I hope this helps. Feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. And I want to direct monitor exactly what I'm going to be recording and not some extra veiled hiss that I think is going in the recording. When I first got the device, I thought all that was going into the recording. Thank goodness it is not. But maybe that'll help some people on that situation. And the last con I have is if you're on a PC, you cannot use the device with anything lower than Windows 10. That could be a, a no-go for some people. Now, when it comes down to my personal take on the device, I'll say this. If you are a musician or you even are a podcaster, but you lean heavily into music, this could be a good dual-purpose device for you if you take into consideration all the cons that I mentioned. However, if you are just an audio podcaster, one 32-bit float is not necessary for spoken word. You're not going to be, hopefully, you're not going to be speaking at, at a dynamic range that's going to clip. Even at 16 bits, you have plenty of headroom. And at $200, 
there are devices that are much, much cheaper. In fact, I have one sitting on my desk in a review coming up, tees, 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 that is a quarter of the price and would work fine for a spoken word podcaster. So if you're just simply podcasting and you're not using the musical elements, then I would bypass this device and get a standard 16-bit or 24-bit audio interface. Even at $129, you can get the Audient Evo 4 that has a nice mute button right on it. And all the other devices have volume knobs that you can just turn down and mitigate if you have to cough or whatever and then track back to whatever your level was. Overall, it's a cool device. I had a lot of fun with it. And if I were musically inclined, it would probably stay in my studio. But since I'm not musically inclined. I'm not going to be using MIDI. I'm not going to be using hi Z. It's not really necessarily for a standard podcaster. Can it be used that way? Of course it can, but I don't think that it's totally necessary. But what do you think? How do you like the sound of the UAC-232 paired with its cousin, the Zoom ZDM-1? Be sure to chime in in the comments down below. Coming up soon is my competition sub $100 microphone audio interface challenge against Jeremy over at Obscure Mike's YouTube channel. That's coming up pretty soon. But right now you can check out this video to find out what audio interface I would select for podcasters. Thank you.